Hi there, welcome back to Sunday Seminary Online. I'm Brennan Breed. We're on our eighth week of studying the prophets of the exile. Uh, We are coming near the conclusion of our study of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Last week, we talked about Jeremiah's oracles against uh, the kings and head priests and prophets, folks who were in charge. Uh, And this week, uh, we're going to cover th- uh, three, really two and a half, I guess, uh, uh, narratives or stories um, that deal with Jeremiah's run-ins with the authorities. Uh, and the Jeremiah, uh, well, we're going to come into contact with more of these, by the way. There's there's more um, after uh, the next uh, uh, section, which we'll cover next week, which will be the oracles of salvation that Jeremiah gives, uh, including the most famous verse in Jeremiah, that is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Uh, this this uh, part of the larger um, section of uh, what we might call the, the kind of book of consolation. It's actually the, the letter to Jeremiah. It's just before the book of consolation, but it's a shift uh, from uh, oracles of judgment to oracles of salvation. So we'll talk about that next week. Uh, but this week, uh, we're going to talk about Jeremiah's, um, the narratives, or at least uh, two of them, a little bit more than two of them, um, that, uh, that deal with Jeremiah's courage in the face of authorities that are trying to kill him uh, for bringing his message. We're going to take a little brief segue uh, into the book of Micah, uh, which is actually referenced here in Jeremiah. There's an amazing bit here that lets us in, it gives us a little window um, into the, the development of a religion of the book, uh, which uh, was a, a first as far as we know in the history of the world um, at this point in time at least in this area in the ancient Near East. Um, So uh, in any event, like I said, there's other stories about Jeremiah's run-ins with the authorities. There's a story about a pit. Um, There's a story about uh, a a scroll that Jeremiah um, has dictated that Baruch the scribe has written down um, that uh, is cut up and thrown into a fire and so on. Uh, uh, There's there's more interesting stories later on. But um, this week we're going to cover the story of uh, Jeremiah being on death row for his prophesying against the temple, uh, which we talked about in chapter 7. Uh, but comes back in chapter 26. Uh, and then we're talking about the, the sort of two-stage story of the sign of the yoke uh, in chapter 27, where Jeremiah receives the prophecy of the yoke. Uh, and then in chapter 28, uh, where the prophet Hananiah and Jeremiah come into conflict over the yoke. So we're going to see conflict with kings, conflict with prophets, conflict with elders. Um, and uh, uh, and but we're also going to see uh, a mysterious family that comes to Jeremiah's aid. Uh, and we'll also see a reference to uh, the scriptures, a really prophetic words functioning as as scripture, um, which uh, this is sort of the earliest we, we can find people using prophetic texts as holy scripture. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. Uh, so in any event, uh, without further ado, remember Jeremiah is preaching um, these words to a community that is about to go into exile. And this book was fashioned to try to help people survive through the trauma, through the disaster of the of the exile, of the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the hoped for city, the city that um, was kind of promised in advance, but then also uh, functioned as part of God's promise uh, to David and to the people of Jerusalem, to the people of Judah, uh, more particularly, uh, a place of safety and, and comfort, um, of uh, success um, uh, that later, uh, of course, was destroyed, uh, along with the king and the kingship, the Davidic kingship. So this two-part promise that God had given uh, falls apart before people's eyes. And uh, the book of Jeremiah really exists to try to help people move, to help them understand what happened and why it happened, but also to help them move beyond um, and to help build a faith uh, that perseveres um, and that moves beyond uh, the, the time of the disaster itself, um, which, uh, you know, it's it's amazing that uh the, what comes out of this eventually is the Jewish faith and then and then the Christian faith, with, which develops out of the Jewish faith. So it's just amazing to see uh, this kind of lineage um, of, of faith that comes out of out of disasters. Um, we'll see this um, the, in, in repeated many times, but also in the Christian faith, the disaster of the cross, uh, that Jesus, the hoped for one, dies an ignominious death. Um, this study is going to kind of lead us, in, you know, up into the time of Easter. Um, and it, it it's amazing that, you know, a, a crucified Messiah was an oxymoron. Uh, anyone who said that they were the son of God and that they were, had come to save people and save the world, being crucified on a cross was the, was a criminal's end. Um, and, and so having the, the possibility to have a faith that moves through disaster and then tries to see some hope beyond and perseveres in the midst of that hope and and hears a story um, and and can have faith in a God that moves through spaces of of disaster. Um, 
this is this is what gives poss- the possibility of the Christian message. Um, so uh, and in contemporary Jewish thought and belief as well. So uh, Jeremiah has obviously come up um, in conversations about the Holocaust as well, uh, uh, when the Jewish community, the global Jewish community, um, suffered uh, unimaginable um, persecution. Uh, how was it possible for the Jewish people and the Jewish faith uh, to continue through the midst of that disaster? Well, um, none of this, I, I, I firmly believe that none of this would have been possible um, had it not been for uh, uh, faithful people like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, um, who prophesied the disaster, but also helped people move through it um, and move into uh, a beyond. Um, and part of this is that they had to come into conflict with very powerful people um, who were preaching uh, and trying to get people to only believe happy things or good things. Um, you know, this reminds me of certain leaders that we've had recently in American history um, who have told us, hey, uh, nothing bad's going to happen. Um, you know, everything's great. Uh, don't worry about any problems. You know, anyone who's trying to say that there's problems or are trying to stir up, you know, controversy or or they're making it all up. It's a hoax, you know, these kind of problems that we see around us. Um, and then we have other people who say, no, we need to own up to the problems uh, that exist around us, even if it seems negative or it seems like you're a downer now or you're questioning the goodness of our country or our, our people or our church. Um, uh, just today, uh, I saw a news story of uh, the leader of a very conservative uh, Christian denomination um, that is, you know, would, would seem to be uh, and is, uh, full in, in full voice, you know, is very pro America. Um, you know, uh, is, is want to uh, to talk about things like racism, um, that, which is a persistent uh, issue in American society and history and in contemporary culture as well. Uh, but this this leader of the Southern Baptist Church. Um, said, hey, we aren't as welcoming to, to people of other colors as, as as we want to be. And he, he's addressing a mainly white denomination, obviously, right? I mean, so he's speaking to white people, and he knows he's speaking to white people. And he says, people of color, especially black people, aren't don't feel terribly welcome in our churches, and why is that? Um, and uh, he says, you know, uh, the Southern Baptist Church wasn't sent to uh, save America. We were sent uh, to uh, represent Christ, be ambassadors to all the peoples of the world. Um, so all to say, like this, you know, uh, uh, challenging... Um, things like religious nationalism, uh, standing up to uh, authorities, uh, powerful people within uh, religious structures like denominations, but also people within political structures um, who have a lot of power, um, but also standing up to people who uh, have made a lot of money and and made a lot of uh, friends and so on, um, have a lot of capital, kind of social capital, um, from preaching things that people want to hear. Standing up to people like that uh, is often dangerous, uh, often ends your career. Right. Uh, if you're the whistleblower or if you're the person who says the thing that everyone needs to hear, but that no one wants to hear, uh, then oftentimes that spells doom for you. Um, and we see that in Jeremiah's own lifetime, that almost spelled doom for him several times, but God kept rescuing Jeremiah. And so that's, that's what these narratives show is that being faithful oftentimes means being courageous, being brave, standing up to authorities uh, and saying the thing that you know that God wants you to say. Uh, and and struggling through the difficulties of that. Now, remember, Jeremiah doesn't take out this all stoically. Remember those confessions where Jeremiah yells at God about all this? I don't want to. I don't want to go through this. Well, you know, are are you even helping me? You know, are you with me here? So all to say, remember when you read these stories of how courageous Jeremiah is. Also, remember that Jeremiah is not stoic. Um, that that he is the, all the time yelling at God about this. Um, so those are both uh, both part of being a faithful believer uh, is. Uh, f- knowing that your relationship with God is strong enough for you to say those things that uh, you can't say to even people that you love, right? Being totally honest uh, with God um, is a prerequisite for being a a faithful believer. Um, And at the same time, uh, committing yourself to standing up and doing what you know is right. Um, And both of those uh, are are part of their their intention with one another a little bit, um, but uh, but but they are part of uh, the dynamic that we see with all of these uh, faithful prophets um, in in times of crisis. So um, I'm going to reduce my size a little bit here. Um, so remember uh, earlier we talked about uh, Jeremiah and Pasher. We had two different uh, Pashers, um, uh, and uh, Jeremiah was put in the stocks, uh, as you see in the image here showing uh, in chapter 20. Um, and then we had oracles in chapters 20 through 25 about King Zedekiah, King Jehoahaz, uh, King Jehoiakim. Um, we, we had these all these oracles against leaders, uh, and along with them, their 
prophets and their priests uh, who profited off of their reigns uh, and told them what they wanted to hear. Jeremiah was the countercultural one who told them what they didn't want to hear. What's amazing is that all the, you know, people ask, were there prophets, you know, who fought against Jeremiah. Yes, we actually have the name of one of them here, Hananiah. Jeremiah wasn't the most popular guy. In fact, he was like one of the least popular guys um, uh, who were prophesying in that time. Um, but Jeremiah's words continue to exist and they are part of this. And Hananiah's words are not precisely because Jeremiah said what needed to be said, what God told him to say um, in the midst of the disaster and not what people wanted to hear. Um, so in any event, uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 26 uh, moves us from those prophecies against uh, kings into narratives that show us what happens when you prophesy against kings, which shows us both uh, the kind of the terror of this, uh, but also of God's saving help. Um, although there are, um, it, it, just because God doesn't save someone doesn't mean that they're not faithful. And we see that in chapter 26 as well. Okay, so uh, uh, chapter 26 um, picks up, uh, this is part of the kind of confusing nature of the book of Jeremiah and how it's organized, picks up where chapter seven left off. If you remember chapter seven, that was a really crucial chapter for us because it's a certain sermon that Jeremiah gives um, that kind of solidifies a lot of his message. It helps us to see what Jeremiah means by his um, uh, more performative uh, uh, poetic oracles that he gives. So if Jeremiah chapter 5 and 6 are really hard to read because they're ancient poetry, chapter 7 is pretty much a straightforward sermon um, where he says, uh, you look at this temple and you think that this thing's going to save you because God promised that uh, God will dwell in the temple. Uh, you look at the king and you think the king's going to save you because God promised a Davidic king on the throne. Um, those things are aren't get out of jail free cards. Those things aren't going to save you no matter what. The God has a limit. Uh, and if you become an enemy of God, then God is going to, uh, uh, in some way at least, uh, uh, dismantle your your kingdom. Uh, and God is going to rebuild you in a different way. Uh, God is going to free the people who you have oppressed. Uh, and how do you love God? Um, well, it, Jeremiah says it very, very, how, how are you faithful to Yahweh? How are you faithful to the to the God of the covenant? Um, he says, you know, fix your ways and then I'll dwell with you. If you want God's presence near you, here's what you got to do. Verse five, here's how you're supposed to live. If you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you don't go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place. So help the needy be just with one another, um, help those who are vulnerable. And that's how you show your love for God. God loves the people who are vulnerable. And and this is the the, ex the story of the Exodus, right? I mean, God comes to uh, liberate those who, who have been hurt by others and, and taken advantage of by those with power. Um, and uh, uh, Jeremiah also says that there's a problem. If you continue to do these things, that God's going to dismantle this temple. God's going to dismantle uh, this this uh, city, Jerusalem, that you trust in so much. God's going to take away the king that you trust in so much because they're now an impediment uh, to you doing the right thing and following God. Uh, and they now are functioning as bulwarks um, of oppression. So uh, in chapter 26, we see what happens. Or you might ask, like, what happens when you get up and you preach about how a king's going to kill you? Well, Amos 7 uh, verses 10 through 17 show us a little bit of the palace intrigue that a, a priest was listening to the prophet Amos say some things like this about how the king was going to die and God's going to take apart the temple. And the, the priest heard, and then the priest told the king. And then the king said, tell him he's going to die. Um, so it's it's treason to say these things about the king uh, in an ancient culture. And it's treason to say these things about the, the temple, the main temple, which is the royal chapel. Uh, so if you say the temple's going to fall apart and the king's going to die, um, you're preaching rebellion in the ancient world, at least. Um, so, uh, and, and there's a there's a consequence for that. So chapter 26, like uh, chapter 7 just kind of ends. Jeremiah says these things and then we move on to another, another chapter. Um, but chapter 26 picks up on that narrative where it left off. It kind of summarizes the speech in chapter 7 a little bit. So it starts off at the beginning of the reign of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah. This word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house. Now we, we're kind of getting the instructions for Jeremiah to go do the sermon that we read in chapter 7. Stand in the court of the Lord's house. Uh, this is the court, like the out, outdoor courtyard where everyone could, uh, um, people could congregate. Um, and uh, it wasn't just for the priests. 
and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord. So this is probably a feast day where people have traveled from all around Judah to be there and sacrifice and so on and participate in worship in the, in, in, in the temple. Um, and so, so Jeremiah is yelling at tons of people who were there on a feast day. Um, so speak to all these people from all over. Speak to them the words that I command you. Don't hold back a word. It may be that they will listen, all of them, and will turn their evil ways. And I may change my mind about the disaster that I intend to bring on them because of their evil doings. You know, maybe here's, so the prophets don't just preach doom and gloom. Uh, the prophets preach doom and gloom, but they also say, hey, there's a way out of this. All we have to do is just treat each other justly and look out for those who are vulnerable. If we do those things, then God will be with us and we don't have to worry anymore. Um, if we don't do those things, then we have to worry. So uh, verse four, uh, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I have set before you and to heed the words of my servants, the prophets whom I send to you urgently, though you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh and I will make this city a curse for all the nations of the earth. Shiloh is a place that God had destroyed uh, for um, the sort of, um, the uh, unfaithfulness of the priests who lived there, the Elides, uh, the sons of Eli. Um, there's another story about that in Samuel, but in any, in any event, the Jeremiah references this in chapter seven. So this is basically a summary of that um, of that sermon there. And then verse seven, so what happens next? There's the story part. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. What you have prophesied in the name of the Lord? Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying this is going to be like Shiloh and we're going to, the world going to be ruined? Are you kidding me? So this is, again, treason. Uh, and you, you can't say these things. Uh, and the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So they grab him, right? And there are probably a lot of people in the crowd who thought, well, maybe Jeremiah's right. And that might have been why it was so dangerous, because, you know, they, the, the, the authorities look around and a bunch of the people look around. They see people saying, going, Wow. Yeah, this is really important. This is a condemnation of the way things have been going. Um, so, so they grabbed Jeremiah to shut him up. Uh, verse 10, when the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. So sitting in the gate, uh, this is a place, a, a, a courtyard. Uh, this would have been like kind of an open space where um, you could let people into the gate area, but you didn't have to let them into the city. So it was a place where you could do a kind of... Uh, Commerce, you could sell things, buy things, you could meet with people who weren't really allowed in the city. Cities were oftentimes very gated places in the ancient world, very protective because you didn't want to let strangers into your city because you didn't know what they were going to do. Um, again, there's not much water in the ancient world, there's you know a shortage of resources. Uh, people were worried about their neighbors, um, uh, the, you know, other peoples from far away uh, being allowed into their spaces. Um, so the, the place of judgment then uh, would have been this kind of um, middle space of the gate, a gate area. I mean, this would have been a big, broad, um, uh, open space. Uh, and there's actually even evidence um, from places like Dan, a city in the very far north, uh, where there were like kind of recesses in the gate where uh, and seats where elders could sit and then sit in judgment. Um, so again, this is a big deal because Jeremiah is a prophet and prophets are supposed to say things in the ancient world that support the king, that are good for the king, that are good for the nation because prophets' words are powerful. If prophets say good things, it's understood that um, like it, they do something. Words matter. They, they have an effect. You know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can't hurt me is something people say today. But in the ancient world, they didn't say that. They said words do stuff. They, they, they matter. Curses matter. They, they have effect. Um, blessings have effect in the ancient world. Um, and I, I think actually ancient people got this more right than we did because people say sticks and stones break my bones, but words can't hurt me because words hurt them. <laughs> That's why they say them. Um, words actually are things uh, and they, they can be weapons and tools to build and to hurt. Um, so in any event, uh, a prophet's words were understood to be particularly effective. If a prophet said good things, it was understood that this had more of a possibility to make good things happen. What Jeremiah says though is, I only have the power to say what God tells me to say. Um, so in any event, um, they're sitting in this gate uh, uh, of the house of the Lord, so this gate kind of into the temple area, um, and uh, they're they're going to kind of sit up, uh, set set up a, a tribunal, uh, and uh, it's the officials of Judah who come, by the way. So this is the king's men who come, uh, and then verse eleven, the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, they're kind of you know he's being tried here a bit. Uh, this man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. So treason, the charge of treason, and he deserves the death penalty. So Jeremiah is on death row. Uh, Jer then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials. He gets a little bit of, of defense here of all the people saying, it is the Lord who has sent me to prophesy against the house and the city, all the words you've heard. He said, I, I'm, 
I don't, I'm not saying this stuff just because I hate the temple or something. Um, I'm saying this because this is what God said. It's my job. I'm a messenger, right? That's what prophets are, messengers of God. Now, verse 13, now, therefore, mend your ways and doings and obey the voice. voice. Don't put me on trial because of what I said. If you think what I said has bearing and, and, and importance and has some power to it, then do what I said instead of trying to eradicate the voice of the messenger. We see this stuff happen all the time. Um, I mean, I think about the Me Too stuff, which, you know, of course, there's every time you talk about something like me, the Me Too movement, where uh, women raise voices and concerns, and, and some men, uh, men too, raise concerns about sexual abuse in the workplace um, and sexual harassment in the workplace, um, oftentimes repeated and, and you know, this has effect on people's careers. So the Harvey Weinstein case and things like this, um, you will always hear people say, uh, oh, the, you know, there are people who can abuse it. Yes, yes, people can abuse the Me Too thing. They can say things that didn't make sense. I mean, uh, I have a friend who tweeted something that a conservative columnist didn't like, and uh, uh, then they people called in harassment on the workplace, you know, issues, um, uh, they were totally fabricated, people didn't even work there and so on. So all to say like this, yeah, fine, it can be abused. But the vast majority of the things that you've read about in the news, you know, it, they turn out to be true, right? A lot of these very powerful people have used their power to use other people. Um, and, you know, it's just amazing to me to see over and over again people saying, well, kind of, there's a lot more anger at the people who are raising their voices than people, you know, than, than concerned to do something about it. Um, you can see this in a lot of kind of whistleblower issues where people get really mad about what the whistleblower pointed out, but they kind of want to forget about what happened. Um, there was a, a, a thing I saw just the other day about a podcast that was uh, uh, from a, a place called Gimlet uh, that was pointing out some issues of uh, sexual abuse and uh, uh, harassment in the workplace of Bon Appetit, a magazine. And it was pointed out that there was actually um, sexual harassment going on and endemic to the Gimlet podcast, uh, uh, this this Gimlet group. Um, and they stopped the podcast on Bon Appetit because of it. In other words, they just, you know, well, let's just shut everything down so that we can avoid, uh, you know, instead of saying, um, no, all this needs to be exposed, right? Uh, if you're using somebody else for your own gain and you're abusing them, yes, you, you, this needs to be exposed. And, and, and we can see this in all kinds of different areas in, in corporations, in government, uh, in churches, um, right? Uh, this kind of push for secrecy. Um, I worked for a church once uh, where there was a, a sexual abuser who was on staff. Uh, I was also um, on staff. I didn't know about these things until the accusations came out. Um, when the accusations came out, the church uh, uh, tried as hard as possible to uh, keep everyone from knowing the truth, but also um, tried to like silence uh, the accuser and other accusers as well who started to come forward. Uh, this was all hidden from me until years later uh, when I had some conversations with one of the people who, who, who was abused and brought this forward. And just to see how much money and time and effort, um, how much, how many threats, uh, how much uh, violence, you know, in, in not, not just in terms of physical violence, although there was that involved, but um, there was also, you know, threats of violence and uh, and so on. How, how much was tied up in trying to um, keep a lid on this situation instead of just doing what was right. I see this happen over and over again. And this is exactly what we see happening here in Jeremiah. So Jeremiah says, just, just, just do the right thing. And then I won't say these things anymore. And, you know, I'll stop saying them if you stop doing these things and God will stop. And, you know, God's the one who's behind all this anyway. So, uh, God's not going to stop just because you hurt Jeremiah. Um, so in any event, uh, uh, verse uh, 14, um, but as for me, Jeremiah says, I'm here in your hands. So you can't stop this word. You can kill me. I'm, in, I'm right here. And you can, you can do, do with me as seems good and right to you. And here Jeremiah says, I can't get out of the death row by myself. And I, I'm not going to tell God to do this for me. In other words, um, this doesn't mean one thing or another if you kill me. Like it doesn't prove that you're right or something. Uh, Verse 4, 15, only know for certain that if you put me to death, you'll be bringing innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to speak all these words into your ears. So in other words, the, the, you know, Jeremiah is saying, you, you trying to kill me for saying what I'm going to say, you, you can do it. It's in your power to do it. I can't stop you. I don't have a magic wand. I'm not a prophet like Elijah that I'm just going to bust a hole in this wall and run out. Um, no, you're going to kill me if you want to kill me. Um, but that's more innocent blood. This is exactly the problem that you've been pursuing all along. Uh, so then verse 16, then the officials and all the people, I uh, mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's, that, that, that's the condemnation, you know, this is the sign of your own self-condemnation uh, that you would even think about doing this. Verse 16, then the, all the officials and the people said to the priests and the prophets, 
This man does not deserve the sentence of death. So Jeremiah's words actually matter to some of the people, right? Uh, this guy doesn't really deserve the sentence of death. For he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Like, you know, do you want to kill this prophet? Like before you even know if he's right or not? And then verse 17, this is where things get really interesting. And then some of the elders of the land, elders of the land tend to mean uh, probably people who aren't part of the royal family, although they might you know, kind of be kind of like aristocrats from around the country, landholders um, who have some power uh, but aren't necessarily royal, right? Um, so some of the elders of the land arose and said to all the assembled people. So this is a this is a power group that is located outside of the temple and outside of the palace. And they stand up and they say, Micah of Morasheth, who prophesied during the days of King Hezekiah of Judah, said to all the people of Judah. And then there's a quotation from the book of Micah. The prophetic book of Micah. It's one of the minor prophets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed up as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house of wooded height. Did King Hezekiah and Judah and all Judah actually put him to death? Didn't he fear the Lord and trust favor of the Lord? And didn't, didn't God change God's mind about because people listened and then and then God didn't do this this stuff? So in other words, there was a guy named Micah who prophesied that Jerusalem was going to get mowed to the ground Everyone, including the king and the priest, listened to him, and then God didn't do the disaster that God had, prof had promised. Um, okay, so this takes a little bit of a detour here, but um, if you can turn to Micah, this is kind of amazing. This is the earliest kind of citation of a prophet's words. Micah lived about a, a century and a half before Jeremiah. So Micah lives sometime around the year, I don't know, 750 to 700. BC. Um, and he's speaking to King Hezekiah. So this is like the latter half of that. So, you know, let's say like uh, right around the year 720 or something. Um, Micah uh, is a prophet who is preaching to uh, the people of Judah. Uh, and he lives in a place called Morasheth Gath. Uh, Gath is in Philistia. It's over, if you can see my pointer, it's over here, the border of Philistia and Judah. It's a Philistine city that was later taken over by Judah. And there's a little suburb of it called Morasheth Gath. So the name of the city was probably Morasheth, Morasheth near Gath, kind of a suburb of the larger city. So an Israelite, uh, so a Judahite really, um, part of the southern kingdom of Judah, a uh, farming town uh, that was uh, near uh near Gath. And we can actually see that it was a, a little farming village that ended up being turned into a strong military garrison, a royal garrison uh, by the 8th century. So Micah was this prophet who was prophesying things. Uh, he was saying really how upset he was. He was uh, over and over again uh, decrying the changes that had happened um, in um uh, in Judah during the time of, of King Hezekiah and just before. So this is part of that larger 8th century conversation that I talked to you about before. I don't know if you remember this, but um, uh, it, uh, well, I think maybe the second video uh, that in this series, um, I talked about this, the changes that happened in Israel in the 8th century. Uh, so from the year 1200, the kind of emergence of Israel where uh, the cities and towns um, were remarkably egalitarian. Um, there's not a lot of luxury goods, but where they are, they're distributed throughout the community. Uh, there seems to be an equitable uh, division of food and labor. Um, there, these are kind of resilient small communities, but also weak. Um, so uh, neighboring uh, peoples, the Philistines and so on, could come and, and if they had larger armies and more centralized authority structures, they could easily take whatever they wanted from these folks. So they were vulnerable. This is why Israel ends up developing a kingship. At the same time, you can see these transformations that happened from the year 1200 BC. This is Beersheba, a Judahite town. Um, you can see they've got these four room houses and so on uh, right around the year 1200. This is one of these remarkably egalitarian uh, uh, new, new communities that emerge. Um, but then by 800 BC, the kingship has emerged and the kingship has risen. This is 200 years after David um, and Solomon. And and by, by the time of Micah, um, this walled city has been built by the local peasants out of their own labor. You have cisterns and reservoirs in the, in the corner over there is a, a deep well to withstand a siege. You've got people serving in the army. You have lots of animals used by the army, horses and the like that you have to feed now. Um, you have a, a developed royal administration. You have a developed taxation system. People have been forced to specialize in certain goods. This has ruined uh, many people's livelihoods, many of these farmers who lived in these small resilient communities. Um, at the same time, it gave them more defense. It, uh, it radically changed the lives and created a peasantry, um, created poverty in a way uh, that it was radically different from, from what existed before. And, and along with it, you get this idea of poverty, like that people shouldn't be poor. People shouldn't be like this, right? And people start to remember the covenant, the covenant with Moses, where all people were promised land, uh, 
in perpetuity, right? Inheritable land through their families. All people were promised a right to be able to farm their own land and, and live a good life off of it. Um, all people were were promised uh, that that they would would share together in the bounty of the land, um, and this is not what was happening uh, by the eighth century. So Micah is yelling about this because he's seen his own community, Morasheth, transform radically, uh, and all the land has been taken. Chapter two of Micah, um, you can see that the, uh, he talks about these people. Uh, Micah is again a prophet who's prophesying against them. Who says these people uh, covet. D fields, verse two of chapter two, covet fields and seize them houses. They take them away. They oppress householder and house people and their inheritance. And this is the inheritable land, uh, the land that Yahweh has promised every family. Um, it's been it's been stolen from them by these elite. Uh, and uh, Micah also gets mad at prophets. Verse chapter two, verses uh, six through eleven is him preaching about how people are preaching to him that he shouldn't preach uh, because what he preaches is that, that the, the people of Judah have been now treated, the, the farmers of Judah have been now treated as enemies and they're being attacked by their own kings. Uh, they're getting everything taken from them. Uh, and then chapter three, we see this kind of disgusting uh, metaphor um, in chapter three of Micah. Micah says, and I, and I said, listen, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, you kings, should you not know justice? You who hate the good and love evil? You tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones and you put them like, you cook them in a kettle. So it's it's about uh, cannibalism basically, but they're not, the kings aren't cannibals. The kings would hear this and say, I didn't eat anyone. I just ate nice food, right? But the people who are producing the food that the kings are eating and taking for themselves and eating, um, that's their livelihood. So you're, you're consuming the things they need to consume, right? You are what you eat. Well, you're eating the food that, that belonged in a baby's mouth and they don't have it anymore and they're dying of hunger, right? That's, in other, Micah's saying that's like cannibalism, right? Um, but then he, he uh, continues and he says, look at chapter three, verse nine. Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel, you know, you, you people in charge, you who abhor justice, you pervert all equity, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Wow, I mean, Jerusalem's supposed to be God's holy city, right? And you're supposed to really, I mean, like many prophets would think you're only supposed to say good things about Jerusalem. But here he says it's blood and you know, it's, it's terrible. Verse 11, it's rulers give judgment for a bribe, it's priests teach for a price, it's Prophets give oracles for money, yet they lean upon Yahweh and they say, surely Yahweh is with us. Surely the Lord is with us. So remember the promise to Jerusalem and the temple and the Davidic kingship, God, God's going to be with you. Um, they say, God promised to be with us, which means I can take all the money I want, right? And I can preach happiness and peace and prosperity. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's something called the prosperity gospel that gets preached all over the place. And some, some people who would say, oh, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. They still kind of do this. You know, there's kind of like a Christianity that's all about believing good things or thinking good things all the time being wholly optimistic or um, uh, it's kind of a name it, claim it kind of theology, right? You know, pray for the, the Porsche that you want because uh, you're going to get it. That's a sign of God's favor. These pastors that fly around in planes all over the country and everything else. You know, this stuff is toxic uh, and um, it's globally very powerful uh, and influential uh, and uh, it's not new. Uh, this was this was around in the time of Micah in the year 720 BC and uh, it was right there in the time of Jeremiah. Uh, and Micah says uh, this stuff where you're getting money from prophes prophesying and preaching only things that people want to hear, he says it's like a drug. Um, it's uh, uh, he, in chapter two, verse 11, Micah is talking about these prophets that are and priests that are teaching people only things that people want to hear. And he says, if someone were to go about enter, uttering empty falsehoods, if someone's preaching just junk, saying, I'll preach to you of wine and strong drink. Strong drink means beer. I'm going to preach to you of wine and beer. Now, what wine and beer do is like, it's a sedative, right? It, it relaxes you. It makes you calm. It makes you a little bit happy, right? It lets you loosen up a bit. Um, he says, such would be a preacher for one of these people. You're, if your preaching is sedating people and making them slightly happy, you know, if your preaching is doing what heroin does. Um, maybe it makes people happy. Maybe they'll pay a lot for it. Uh, but ultimately, like heroin, it deadens you uh, and it makes you not want to live anymore. Uh, it makes you not want to do things and be, you know, be a productive member of God's mission, right? Uh, that is to say, uh, um, it, what makes people feel happy oftentimes is not what prophets and Christians are uh, in, in uh, you know, kind of drawing it forward to the future um, are, are, are called to do, right? Um, 
Uh, so, uh, sure, you know, no harm is going to come upon us is what these preachers are saying, right? But then verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12 of Micah is radical. Radical because Micah, this guy who lives in Judah, which is built around the idea of the Davidic kingship and about the, the holiness uh, and, and protectiveness of Jerusalem, that it's God's special place. He says, therefore, because of you, not because of God, God doesn't want to do this, because of you, the leaders, and not because of the poor farmers or whatever, it's because of the leaders, Zion shall be plowed up as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Jerusalem is going to get plowed up, turn into agricultural space. It's going to be plowed, which uh, can mean destroyed by a form, by, by a rival king. And it almost was in the year 701. Jerusalem was surrounded by a rival king, a much stronger king, uh, the Neo-Assyrian king, um, uh, who surrounds uh, uh, Hezekiah in Jerusalem and traps him up uh, like a bird in a cage. Um, he says, this is the Neo-Assyrian king Sennacherib, by the way, who wrote about this. Uh, we have a prism inscribed by him that talks about this event. Um, and he says, I shut him up, but, but, but I ended up kind of leaving. Uh, I just left. Uh, the book of Kings says that uh, Hezekiah paid a lot of money to make him leave, but also the book of Kings says that God sent a plague upon uh, the Neo-Assyrian camp and they left, um, in part because Hezekiah uh, said he was sorry. He, he repented. He, he, he confessed and, uh, and confessed to Isaiah, uh, it says, a prophet who lived at the same time as Micah, um, and, he, and, and repented and, and the Neo-Assyrian army left. God saved Jerusalem uh, and... This is also what Isaiah was saying, too, at the same time. Uh, you know, you need to change in order for God to uh, have mercy on this city. And uh, otherwise, God's going to unbuild it using this Neo-Assyrian king as a tool. God doesn't, you know, want to do this. But God is going to use this other army as a tool to unbuild Jerusalem so that it could be rebuilt in a better way. And by the way, those farmers, thinking of Micah 3, for chapter 3, verse 12, those farmers would have loved the, the poor farmers that are being taken advantage of, they would have loved to hear this because that's more farmland for them, right? You know, instead of being a center of oppression, Jerusalem's now an open farm, uh, right? Let's, let's, have, let's have fun there. You know, let's, uh, let's make some food there. Um, that's what they would have thought about this. All to say, this is the verse, chapter 3, verse 12 of Micah. This is the verse that is quoted to save Jeremiah's life. So when Jeremiah is on death row in chapter 26, um, this verse, which was famous precisely because it was so critical of the leadership of Jerusalem, the royal monarchy, the Davidic monarchy, critical of the priesthood in the temple, um, uh, critical of uh, all of the, the prophets uh, that had any power at that point in time, um, except for Isaiah, I guess, who was saying things roughly similar to Micah. Um, but uh, all to say, you know, the, 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 there was a minority of prophets who, who were saying things uh, that, that, that were actually actually constructive, but were critical, right? Critical, constructive, right? Um, so uh, all to say, uh, Jeremiah is on death row, and this this group of elders of the land come forward with a scroll. And this is radical too, because uh, up to this point in time, the words of a prophet, a living prophet, were really important, but the words of a dead prophet weren't considered to be as important. Um, we have some evidence that right around this time, uh, there were even other uh, peoples, the Neo-Assyrian uh, King Esarhaddon, who ends up kind of editing an older collection of uh, uh, of prophecies and uh, given by prophets of uh, Ishtar of Arbella, modern day herbal in Syria. Uh, but this, the, 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 he received this, these oracles and kind of got, got maybe them or got scribes to update them for his own day, uh, you know, a few decades later when he tried to go on another uh, in, invasion. Uh, but all to say that uh, we have a little bit of evidence that people were like kind of editing older prophecies and like listening to them to, in their own day, but very little. That's the only evidence we have that even people kind of copied down and listened to the prophets outside of their own time. Prophets were all across the ancient Greece were about speaking to a particular time in a particular place. And it, it wasn't really understood that like it would be that important what they said like 10 years from then. Um, uh, so the fact that they've kept the book of Micah, they can refer to it, they know it. They can hear something said by Jeremiah and they can be like, that sounds like Micah to me. And they unroll the scroll. This is radical. Because what it shows us is that, at least at the time of the composition of Jeremiah 26, uh, that, that kind of scripture, the idea of scripture has come about. Um, this, you know, we don't see this. Uh, we, we, we see religious writings from other ancient people, the ancient Near East, but the idea of like, you kind of carry around in your head a scripture that you try to fact check things 
today, based on these words from 150 years ago, um, that's really different from like an ancient ritual or liturgy or a hymn uh, or a prayer of confession. This is really different from like a myth, um, which we can see for lots of in the ancient Near East. This kind of idea of like an ever speaking uh, prophetic word is amazing. Now we're going to come back to this in chapter 36. So this isn't, this isn't the last time I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say this is this is amazing uh, that we see this kind of here. Um, uh, just as an example, this this is the beginning of a transition into a religion of the book, uh, which is something that sets apart Judaism and later Christianity and later Islam uh, from other religions. Um, so there's a religion, this is just an example, there's a religion that emerges about the time of Christianity, so same time, same place uh, in the Mediterranean world. Um, it's a, it's a, a cult of Jupiter, it's, you know, just a, a, there were lots of different kind of um, cults or religious groups, uh, religious associations that, that emerged during the time of Christianity. Um, so this is a, a cult followed by Roman generals. So Roman generals have this kind of religious association that they build right around the same time as Christianity, and it seems to spread in roughly the same area as Christianity. And it spreads at roughly the same pace. Uh, and uh, what, But the only thing we have uh, left from that, um, that the kind of cult that the, the Roman army uh, was prevalent among Roman army generals, this one cult of Jupiter, um, are temples, uh, the remains of temples where we have inscriptions of who belonged to them. But what they believed, what they did when they got together, we have no idea because it was all kind of mysterious or kind of secret in a way. Um, but it also didn't revolve around scriptures. It didn't revolve around written stuff. Now, in contrast, for the first three centuries of Christianity, we have no record of architecture. So the earliest church building we have is Dura Europis. Uh, there's just not a lot of like stuff left behind. But the amount that Christians produced in terms of writing was incredible, voluminous production of writings that preserve, that were preserved. And this is all because uh, Judaism, out of which Christianity emerged, um, you know, so you can make the argument that both of them emerge out of kind of Second Temple Judaism, you know, kind of modern rabbinic Judaism. You know, like there's just a lot of arguments about how exactly to draw the family tree of Christianity and Judaism. They both derive from ancient Israelite religion through what we call Second Temple Judaism or Judaism um, that, uh, uh, you know, around the time of Jesus, we can say. Uh, so all to say like this, you know, it, there's arguments about this. But, uh, but the main thing to say is that th these are religions of texts where texts take the center stage. Um, we can see this also uh, in, say, books like Ezra and Nehemiah, where the temple is obviously really important, but the people gathered together to hear the Torah read aloud, uh, the, the law of God, the, the words of God. Um, and the words of the prophets we see here in Jeremiah are useful, like for hearing what God has to say to our own day. Um, so focusing on texts um, as the centerpiece of your religion was not a common thing in the ancient world. Uh, but we see it kind of emerging here. So I'll just say that this family, and we're going to hear a little bit more about this family, um, and we're going to come back to them in a later week. Uh, but this family, this, this group of like anonymous here, elders, we know who this is. And uh, we actually even have some artifacts from them. But they're an amazing family. Uh, and they're kind of behind some of this. So I'll just say, uh, so the, the, these elders here, anonymous, say verse 19, did King Hezekiah of Judah and all Judah actually put Micah to death? Remember, well, we're, we're here what Micah had to say. Micah said, the worst things you can say about the temple and the kings and the priests and the prophets. But they didn't kill him. They listened to him. They listened to him and they prayed to God and they amended their ways and God averted the destruction. Shall, uh, the, you know, the, the, the king of, of uh, Neo-Assyria did not conquer Jerusalem. Sennacherib turned away. So, but aren't we in a similar situation? We're going to die if we don't listen, right? God is got about to unbuild our oppressive city. So let's do this, right? Um, so then verse 20, there was another man prophesying in the name of the Lord. So, that, I mean, the idea is there that they get him off. This is enough to get him off death row. Now, well, as we'll see, Jeremiah gets on death row again uh, later on. But uh, there was another man prophesying in the name of Yahweh, Uriah, son of Shemaiah from kiriath Jerim. He prophesied against this city and against this land in words exactly like those of Jeremiah. So there were other people saying some of the things. And we don't have a book of Uriah. We don't know exactly what he said, except for the, here the scribe who wrote Jeremiah 26 is telling us this. Um, but he prophesied against this city, against Jerusalem, and against this land, Judah, in exa words exactly like those of Jeremiah. So he didn't say bad things, or he didn't like give a worse account of it. In verse 21, when King Jehoiakim, with all his warriors and officials, heard these words, the king sought to put him to death. 
But when Uriah heard of it, he was afraid and fled and escaped to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent Elnathan, or Elnathan, son of Achbor, and Memethim to Egypt, and they took Uriah from Egypt, and they brought him down to King Jehoiakim, who struck him down with the sword and threw his dead body in the barrel of a place of common people. In other words, there were other prophets who said the same things as Jeremiah and didn't make it. Which means that it's not, you know, you look at a prophet's life and you're like, well, that prophet wasn't listened to. So obviously they didn't have the right thing to say. Or they died. So God doesn't care. Right? Does Martin Luther King Jr.'s testimony and his witness, uh, does it suffer because he was assassinated? You know, he lost, right? He failed. No, uh, uh, you know, in in fact, he was, you know, some, some of his projects didn't come to completion because he was killed in the midst of them. But in fact, that's not evidence that he was wrong or that God was against him. Uh, and in the same way, uh, Jeremiah's success or his, you know, the fact that his life was preserved is not. And Jeremiah says that. This is what he means uh, when he says, uh, as for me, I'm here in your hands. Do with me seems good and right for you. Uh, my death would be innocent blood in your hands, but God might let me die here. Uh, this, this is true faith to say uh, that uh, my success in terms of my kind of prosperity or my, you know, that's no has no bearing on the word of God. God's right no matter what. And so this, I think the story of your eyes put here to say, you don't just look at people's outcomes and say, well, I guess they did they had the right word. Um, and then verse 24, uh, but the hand of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so he was not given over to the hands of the people to be put to death. This is, this is who was behind the elders of the land finding the book of Micah and saying, mm, Micah said this, and convincing the people through scripture um, that, uh, uh, that Jeremiah should not be killed. Um, it's Ahikam, son of Shaphan. Uh, so the family of Shaphan comes back again and again and again. I'm not going to get into them here. I'm going to get into them later. But this, the family of Shaphan is very clearly a supporter of Jeremiah and a supporter of the kind of theology that Jeremiah um, is preaching, which is a Yahweh alone theology. So worship Yahweh alone, but a, a theology that's based in the covenant of Moses. Um, and this seems to be what the family of Shaphan is all about too. Uh, so well, again, another time we'll come back to them, but uh, uh, they're fascinating. Uh, so I'll spend a little bit less time uh, on this, the, uh, what comes next, but the sign of the yoke, uh, this is a, a fascinating story as well. Um, chapter 27 is the prophecy of the yoke. By the way, this is a sculpture uh, by a sculptor with the last name Otto. Uh, it's, it's at Notre Dame, or at least a version of it is in Notre Dame, but he came from Germany. Uh, after World War II to the United States to sculpt and uh, uh, you know lived through the terrors of World War II and so saw a lot of prophets or leaders of the church, right? Um, a lot of uh, people who uh, were entrusted with authority, both politically and uh, religiously, and used it to keep their own necks and um, say what people wanted to hear, uh, say what the authorities wanted to hear, and uh, just preach that everything was fine and dandy in the Nazi, uh, uh, in, the, in the Reich. And uh, when he came to the United States, I mean, he sculpted Jeremiah carrying the yoke uh, because there were people uh, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and so on uh, who did resist um, against uh, the Nazi uh, oppression and did call out things to their own detriment um, who bore the yoke. Uh, so the, the the sign of the yoke in chapter 27 is actually, here's a yoke, by the way, just a little kind of artist rendition. Uh, typically, there were two oxen that kind of shared a yoke, um, but it's uh, either leather or uh, wood in this case, um, you know, something kind of that could hold and then an iron bar that went around it, but they can be made out of lots of different substances. Um, but so Jeremiah uh, uh, is told by God to to create a yoke uh, and wear it around um, in order to show that uh, that people were supposed to, the people of Judah were supposed to um, be subservient, take on the yoke, not of Yahweh, but of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so th this is something that Isaiah uh, had preached, pro the prophet Isaiah, who lived around the year 750 to 700 BC. Um, he lived at the same time as Micah. So a, kind of someone that Jeremiah would have looked up to and from from a long time ago would have seemed ancient to Jeremiah. Uh, Isaiah, um, uh, his big message was, uh, don't be subservient to foreign kings. Don't make any alliances with them. Well, Jeremiah is preaching as hard as he can to say, actually, God's got a new thing. There's a new word here. And the new word is be subservient to Babylon. Don't try to ally with Egypt to fight against Babylon. So those are the two big powers at the time, Babylon and Egypt, and you could pick one or the other. Uh, remember, uh, Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, murders Josiah, who was a big hero of Jeremiah's. So uh, 
Jer Jeremiah might have been kind of predisposed to not not like the Egyptian faction, but also it was it was a bad idea. Egypt was very weak at the time. Babylon was very strong. So Jeremiah is saying, "Hey, listen, uh, here's some foreign policy advice. Just be subservient to Babylon because God has picked them to reign at this point in time over this part of the world." So there's a there's an idea here that Yahweh's kind of in charge of the powers of the world, and that Yahweh's not just going to like make the people who follow Yahweh the most powerful ones all the time. Because that's, that's not what Yahweh's after. Um, Yahweh's going to allow other peoples to, be, to become really powerful from time to time. And you've got to listen to the prophets to hear what to say. But Jeremiah is really mad because there are other prophets who say, no, uh, the king, Yahweh's going to help us win, right? This kind of triumphalist stuff, um, nationalistic stuff. And Jeremiah says, triumphalist nationalism is a sin. Uh, it's and it's leading you astray. It's what you want to hear, uh, but in fact, um, it is uh, a temptation, uh, and it will lead you to ruin. It'll just it'll destroy your city. Uh, it'll destroy your your nation. Uh, and there's all this hope uh, in like verse 19. Jeremiah is speaking to the priests. Hey, you think that the vessels of the temple? Because remember, there were two kind of uh, uh, surrenders of Jerusalem in 597. Jerusalem was surrounded by the Babylonian king because they rebelled against Babylon uh, and they had to give lots of money and stuff from their temple and people. There was a first exile. Ezekiel goes in that first exile in 597 BC. But the walls of Jerusalem weren't destroyed. Jerusalem's temple wasn't destroyed. The palace wasn't destroyed. And in, in the wake of that, uh, there were people during the time of King Zedekiah uh, who said, hey, uh, we lost in 597 to Babylon, but Egypt's really going to take him this time. So Zedekiah seems to gather, and you can see this in verse 3, Zedekiah gathers uh, leaders from other nearby nations, Edom, Moab, Ammonites, uh, king of Tyre, that's the Phoenicians, and the king of Sidon. Uh, so that you get, he's getting the, the nearby kings to gather together to have a, a, an alliance, to make an alliance against Babylon with Egypt. Uh, and Jeremiah is saying this is a terrible idea. Um, uh, but he also says, hey, you're doing this because you think that you're going to like take back the vessels from Babylon or like you think Egypt's going to beat Babylon with your help? Um, no, in fact, that's not what's going to happen. Um, th this story doesn't have a quick, happy ending. And in fact, a lot of what Jeremiah says in chapters 29 through 33, which we'll talk about next week, is that this story doesn't have a quick, happy ending. It does have a happy ending and you can be happy in the meantime, at least many people can be happy in the meantime, but uh, you don't get what, God isn't about getting what you want. God isn't about like saying the right prayer and then like you get you get, you know, the benefits that you ask for or something like that. You know, prayer isn't about demanding something from God um, and then like getting it. Like God's a cosmic, you know, gopher, you know, giving my coffee or something. Um, uh, instead, uh, uh, God has uh, got a much bigger plan uh, that involves sometimes difficulties for individuals uh, or, th or you not getting what you want. Uh, that's simply a part of the, of the larger plan. Uh, and part of trusting God is to say, I don't understand this. Um, and even like Jeremiah, you can yell at God. You can tell God, hey, you failed. You can tell God, uh, you, you lied to me. You can tell those things to God that are on your heart. But in the end, to keep coming back and say, I don't understand this. Um, in the end, I trust you. Uh, that's, that's ultimately what Jeremiah uh, uh, teaches us to say. Um, uh, and then in chapter 28, uh, so Jeremiah is like given this idea of the yoke by God. And then in chapter 28, he uh, goes up to this guy, uh, Hananiah. And Hananiah is a prophet who preaches everything that people want to hear, right? And Hananiah says, hey, that yoke that that guy Jeremiah has. And by the way, like later on in the story, verse 10, you see that Jeremiah is wearing the yoke, although it doesn't say that elsewhere in the story. It's like a joke buried later on in the, in the, in the story. Jeremiah is wearing a yoke and he's like, you know, in the temple area and Hananiah and all these people are around listening to what Jeremiah and Hananiah, these two opposing prophets have to say. And Hananiah says, uh, God's going to break the yoke of ba the king of Babylon. And in two years, all that stuff's going to come back and we're going to bring the people like Ezekiel. We're going to bring them back from exile and everything's going to be great and hunky-dory within two years. Uh, just a little bit, just a little bit of, of, of bad things that are happening and then, you know, a little bit of perseverance and then, but then God's going to quickly bring all this to an end uh, just because God loves us so much and so on. And then uh, verse five, uh, Jeremiah gets up after Hananiah speaks and he says, amen, verse six, amen, I, may the Lord do so. And I love it that Jeremiah is being so sarcastic right here. I mean, maybe he's being honest. Saying, I, I hope it's like that. Yes, I wish it were like that. May these words happen. May God bring everything back from Babylon in two years. And I hope we have independence and things are strong here and good. I hope that would be great. But he says, 
But verse seven, but listen now to the word that I speak. I got a different word than you. I hope yours is right. I don't hope mine is right, but I know mine is right, unfortunately. He says, the prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against countries and great kingdoms. In other words, a lot of times it's bad news, right? Especially against the powerful kingdoms, the great kingdoms. Um, the, the, the folks who think they're strong often need to be told, hey, uh, we need to change. We need to do things differently. And if we don't, there's destruction coming. Think about like climate change or something like the most powerful nations in the world who are creating the most carbon. You know, we need to, we need to do something. We need to, we need to think about this because there's war, pestilence, famine coming if we don't. I mean, that's just, that, that's science, but it's also God who God created the world this way, right? Um, so in any event, uh, as for a prophet, verse nine, as for a prophet who prophesies peace, Jeremiah says, and like, you know, peace, kind of fake peace, right? When the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. So in other words, saying, saying peace, is a lot harder than saying uh, difficult things are coming <laughs> because we can fact check you a couple years from now. Two years later, guess what? Hananiah is not not right. Uh, verse 10, then, then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. <laughs> so Hananiah gets so mad, like punches Jeremiah, beats him up, takes the yoke off and breaks it in public. And then people think like, this is, you know, he says, this is how God's gonna break Yahweh. He's gonna break the yoke of the king of Babylon and so on in two years. And this is Jeremiah goes away. He doesn't argue. He's just like, all right, peace. Uh, you know, what? what's amazing to me is like, I mean, you know, I'd, be, I'd be tempted to yell at him or scream back or, you know, my wounded pride. But for Jeremiah, it's not about his pride. It's about... Okay, uh, you want to you wanna prophesy this stuff? Go ahead. Um, I, I said my piece. But then later on, God says to Jeremiah, hey, hey, take that broken wooden yoke and instead make it one of iron bars because guess what? You're not going to be able to get out of this by yelling and screaming and making a show. Uh, and then verse 15, the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you and you made this people trust in a lie. There's a lot of prophets out there, a lot of religious authorities, political authorities, a lot of people with a lot of power people who have uh, the ability to broadcast their thoughts to a lot and their ideas to a lot of people, and they are making a lot of people trust in lies. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made out of there in getting people to trust in lies. There's very little money and actually a lot of uh, like you know, anger directed at you um, if you uh, try to tell the truth. Uh, therefore, verse 16, thus says the Lord, I'm going to send you off to the face of the earth. God says this to Hananiah. I'm going to, uh, within this year, you'll be dead because you spoke rebellion against the Lord. So Jeremiah got put on death row because he spoke rebellion against the king. And God says, when you say the things the king wants to hear, you're rebelling against the Lord of all, of all the earth. <laughs> That's a much bigger treason, right? That's a form of treason that you've promised. You've made an, made an oath uh, to serve Yahweh and to speak Yahweh's word. But now you're saying just what the kings want to hear. And this is Hannah and I died later that year. Um, so all to say, this is kind of a, a sign in a way of the failure of Hannah and I's message, even though people wanted to continue to believe it. Um, so uh, if you are asking for uh, hope and uh, uh, a kind of consolation, if, if at this point in the story of Jeremiah, all this uh, suffering and so on is beginning, beginning to get to, but um, I understand. Uh, we're going to talk about the hope and consolation that Jeremiah brings when he pivots uh, from words of, of oracles of judgment and when he pivots to oracles of salvation. Um, it's not what people think, though. I'll see you all next week.